Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Hashtag Comedy TV, the comedy show that takes a serious look at the news around us. Pick up, pick up, man. Now, look, before we even start, apologies for last week. Obviously, we wasn't on, but uh, we, we need to take a little break. It's been nine weeks, continuous Sundays here, bringing you all the news and views. So we took a little time off. But anyway, uh, guys, what, what, did you, what did you manage to do for the week? Slim, what did you get up to? Bro, I've just been in some... I've, I've got some big news soon, but I can't say right now. I'm in some negotiations for some... Ooh. Proper teams, you know? So Proper wanga. That, that right now, once it's true, you little all know straight away. But yeah, man. Life like to hear that, man. Like to hear yeah, that. Man. Quincy, what's like happening for you, man? Well, I ain't going to lie to you. I've been inspired by my fellow uh, colleague, Mr. Kane Brown, in the old kitchen. And I've been doing experiment in the old, the old kitchen with the old dishes. Yeah, listen, we, we got to get in. We got to get in the studio one day. That's got a kitchen, and Kane has to chef up some food, and we sit no, down. Cook yeah, yeah, like, no, my reason. Yeah, right, man, you can't right, keep putting right. up them pictures like that, and we don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, brother. I've seen it. I've seen <laughs> it. I was like, you know what? I'm not having this. <laughs> and Kane, what have you been up to this week apart from cooking up a treat, mate? Um. To be honest with you, I've been just working away, man, writing. Um, the usual, bro. Just just working on uh, material. You know how it goes, bro. Come on, man. Trying to utilize on, this time for the best possible, isn't it? It is, man. It's the dawning of a new Aquarius. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, yes. here's what's coming up on the rest of the show. We kick off with some entertaining videos, and Kane will be explaining what the hell this is. Then we'll be discussing stop and search and all things police with former Met Superintendent Leroy Logan. This is your platform here at Hashtag Comedy TV and we appreciate your support. So if you'd like to get involved, please, we need you to like, subscribe, follow and share. Right now, that's the housekeeping done. First up, Quincy, what's happening? Well, mate, as you all know that my team won the Premiership the first time in 30 years. God, and to yeah. prove how long it was since we last won it, this was the kind of style of rap which is out then. Liverpool FC is hard as hell. United Tottenham Arsenal. Watch my list and I will spell. Because they don't just play, but they can rap as well. My idea was it to go Liverpool into a bastion of invincibility, you know. Like... <laughs> yeah, mate, uh, yeah, 30 years on, on um, I'm just letting you guys know, as much as I love my team, rap skills as it improves. Watch this. We are cruising through the league, Arsenal is a wrecking ship. Maybe next season they'll go down to the championship. Leicester is a top team again, Man City is going through a mess. If they don't take it up a gear, we will dominate for years. I'm just going to say to you, he is no Eminem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years, bruv, and that's the best that you look... You had 30 years to write a song, bruv, and that's the best you look come up with. Uh, I, it was bad. Uh, even though uh, it was bad, it was terrible, man. It's just, he's, he's not even helping the white community with that stereotype. <laughs> anyway, listen, football singing obviously isn't what it's used to, uh, what it's used to be. Slim, you're up next. What have you got for us? My clip is in several different parts. It ain't just one clip, yeah? First up, okay. just look at how this bad girl reporter... Deals with a member of the public. Watch this. 
We're really going to get into the height of the rush hour commute, and there's going to be lots more confusion until this whole thing is wrapped up. Reporting live here, the bus, bus uh, Port Authority bus stop on Dollar Miles, Channel 7. You see that? My, my girl blocked him. Go around, rude boy. You understand? Yeah. Respect to her, because you all know it's difficult enough presenting to the cameras, let alone policing members of the public at the same time. So I had soft to her, man. You know what I liked about her, though? She's not in the end, have you noticed, she was, she was saying the name of where she was reporting from, and she said the buzzard, because she was talking about the man, the buzzard, in trouble, even trafficking. <laughs> but she caught herself. <laughs> yeah, that was, that well, was that, definitely that, a, mummy, a mummy block. That was, take yourself oh, away yeah. from the cookie jar. <laughs> yeah, it was. That was a mummy's block. Well, look, the reporter, her name's Donna, yeah? And she was invited on to the Michael and Kiki Good Morning America show. Have a look at this clip and pay special attention to Michael. Come on up. Down the wild, everybody. Yeah, you look great. You look you sit, you sit, sit between us. You sit yes. between us. Did you see where my man was looking? Did, did you see that? Did you I see saw it. it. On national TV, you know. Look, have a look again. I don't think we can help ourselves. I don't think we can help ourselves. I think black man is just attracted to the bottom. Even if it's just to look at and do nothing to, you see a nice bottom, it's hard not to look. Listen, I think yeah, what was going on. Sorry, he was assessing. He was assessing the size of her bottom to see if there was enough space on the settee. So that's what he was doing. He was trying to assess the size of the situation. Assess. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. Okay. Yeah. It's happened to all of us, though. But imagine that my man's being paid. He forgot every bit of professionality, <laughs> and that was. That's when he was brought back down to his basic human being. You understand? No matter what he was doing, he could have been got, at a funeral and would have done the same thing. I tell you what, do you know what? He, at least he got caught for looking behind. Because that, if that, if I was him, I would have been busted from looking at the front. I'm not going to lie to you because I'm a breast man. So <laughs> she would have like, "What are you looking at?" I'm sorry, like I just handed my resignation right now because take the man out of the hood. <laughs> Beauty is there to be though, admired, gentlemen. There to be admired. Kane, what have you got for us, man? Listen, um, um, yeah, before I start now, yeah, um, I just want to warn you lot, if you're eating breakfast, okay, look away now. Have a look at this. Or dinner, or dinner. What the hell is this? Go on, it, you it, lot tell uh, me. <laughs> I'll tell you, is, I, is it Katie Hopkins with a suntan? Oh, fuck with. Oh, my days. <laughs> is that, is that Vibes Cartel? <laughs> is that Vibes Cartel's melanin? <laughs> Let me tell you something, yeah. <laughs> that shit is shit. No. I don't even know. Oh my days. Let me tell you something. I don't even know if you've not been watching this yet. Have you been following the court case with um, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and um, yeah, the publisher yeah. the Sun? On and off. Basically. On and off. Yes, okay. So basically, he's suing them saying that they made an article calling him a wife beater, yeah? Right. Mm. So far, so good. No problem with that. But during the trial, it came out that she shit in his bed as a way of getting back to him. And I think it was because he turned up late to her birthday party or some shit like that. And said yes. that it was the dog. Who does that? And said it was the dog that done it. Uh, what, blame it was that what No, that's man. Human blame, shit. Nah, man, she shit. Yeah, that's human she, shit. She, blamed, she tried to blame it on the dog, say when he was sleeping, yeah? <laughs> and she shit on him. <laughs> and said you know, it's the <laughs> dog. Do it. But I don't know remember, if you guys he realize. Drugs, you know, and he drinks, so when he's out, he's out. Yeah, but you know what? There's certain that's people, so cool. there's certain people, that's a fetish for them, you know? Because I, I, I know a couple of really? geezers, yeah? I, listen, I know a couple of geezers who've been with women and they've told me, they've told them, shit in my handbag, right? <laughs> shit in my nah, handbag. mate. Listen. And that is a fetish that. for some people. <laughs> nah, I but said, told that you is that. Amy. They told me, yeah, no, no, they they that's what cops do. Shit in my handbag. Yeah, so what kind of handbag is that? That's a different kind of fucking oh, You do that. Gucci. Let me tell you. That is a, that's just, that's just a, sorry, that, that's just a, a, a hard version of golden showers. That's all that is. <laughs> I, I don't even know sound what to say, man. It, I don't even, I, yeah. Look at you. Anyway, last by no means least, uh, 
What is it? <laughs> can get his face. People? And animals. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Because, I no, can't because believe it. Prince said animals, it just you know? as easy as R. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My man just took it about. Yeah, it's just a kink. It's just, just, it's just a hard version of that. But Slim, hold on. But the worst thing is, yeah, the man was talking about a girl shitting on his bedroom and, and then drank his drink like he were talking about a girl shitting. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it in the handbag. It's all right. It's uh, delicious. It's That's delicious. delicious. <laughs> Get out the East End, son. It's ruining you. Get out the East yeah. End. You put the work in, son. You put the work in. Oh, right. yeah. All right, it's my time now. It's my time. Look at this clip. And as I was saying before, what is it with white people and animals? They're fearless. So watch this now. So obviously the lion knows the man in the front. That's his brethren, yeah? But the rest in the back, they're just regular tourists. Regular tourists. Look at the lion. The lion is now pushing the driver out of the way to say, yeah, all right, thank you for my meals and wheels. <laughs> Where the key there? Where the key there? <laughs> yeah. Oh, but you haven't seen nothing yet. Watch this now. Watch this. Because the lion can't get the keys, the lion thought, prick this. I can't even wait to get home. Let me, let me sniff out my... I don't even know what to say, boy. This is what we're missing, Mate. guys. This is this is what you <laughs> get with white privilege. Mad. You know what I mean? That is Kane. The Kane. If you was on a safari journey and then put you in the back, of, what would happen, my brother? But I wouldn't have gone. I would have gone. What were they doing no. there? Are they mad? This is this is the thing. What what really upsets me? Yeah, they got, if the lion bit someone, they'd put the lion down. The lion ain't done nothing wrong. Yeah, you saw the lion there in the back, and it looked like it was smelling the customers. Like you know, like when you open your food. You know, like when you get your Chinese yeah. and you open the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. rotted. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Spring rolls. Spring. It looked like it was sizing them up for food. Mm -mm. Yeah. You're mad. Yeah. No way. No way, bro. Yeah. Quincy. Quincy. I, I, I will. That just proved that was that lion was from the motherlands, yeah, and it doesn't like unseasoned food, yeah, because he looked at that. <laughs> it's like every time I tell you, yeah, bring me humans with seasoning it. Stop bring me this bland shit. <laughs> oh God, I have mercy. Slim, I know, say you like wildlife programs and stuff, bro, and I know, I know you, you you're you're good with animals, but would Listen, you be in that situation, my bro? No. That's what I like wildlife programs from the safety of my front room. And there's a <laughs> thousand reasons that run through black people's minds why we wouldn't do that. Like for me, it would be simple things, things that you don't even think about. I say, all right, I suppose that line was brutalized, yeah, mm. when they were younger by a certain person that wear a certain brand aftershave or perfume. Now, when he get on top of that car and he smell that perfume or aftershave again, he can attack just because of memory. This smell here was always horrible to me. Yeah? He ain't looking on features. He just smell it and say, this person used to beat yeah, me. Flashback. I just tear them up. That, that's how I am. That's how I think. I'm not going in there. They're lions. They can eat you. Not even, like, damage you. Done you. Yeah? It looked like people didn't watch the Tiger King. And the little but, Filipino but listen, Chinese girl. Oh. Oh at least that way, <laughs> when you get brutalized by a lion, you don't have to worry about funeral fees because there's nothing left of you to bury. Anyway, you yeah. couldn't pay me. To get to a, you couldn't pay me to get into a cage with that lion. But let's move on because I want to introduce our special guest to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Please give a warm hashtag comedy welcome to uh, former detective superintendent Leroy Logan. Oi, oi. Leroy, oh, how are you, sir? Good day to you, sir. First I'm good, I'm good. I've been listening to the show and uh, trying to get the energy. Uh, as soon as I find the energy, I'll be with you. Is that you look good, good boy, look, you, need, you look good. You, 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 need you look a black like coffee. a test match cricketer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I've got to bring out my Fred Perry's, you know what I mean? Oh, well. Hi, hi, Fred Perry, the originals. <laughs> You're looking very distinguished in retirement, sir. You've got that kind of Viv Richards glow about you. Well, 
in all honesty, it'd be rude not to improve, uh, to really enjoy your retirement because after mm -hmm. 30 years grafting in the Met and surviving that with a smile on my face and a glow in my heart, hey, it's got a, I've got a glow, you know what I'm saying? All right, yeah, man. man. So listen, Leroy, yeah, let me ask you, uh, I want to start at the beginning. What made you want to join Babylon Police Force? <laughs> I, I wanted to reduce my Christmas card list by 95%. <laughs> it worked then. <laughs> because like it was one. clear to me that I had too many friends. So I'll get rid oh. of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my days, man. Leroy spent his, some of his, his retirement money on a comedy course. <laughs> Good stuff. No, okay, what's, you know. what's my so I've been oh, hanging sorry, around Quincy too long. Movie. That's the problem. I've been hanging around Quincy too <laughs> long. Yeah, Have you on, just saw what he was just talking about about shitting in bag. I hope you're not into all of that, sir. I hope you're not. <laughs> no, no. I draw. I draw the line there. I draw the God, line there. Man. Okay, go on, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Getting back to your question, yes. um, I, I yes. was literally a research scientist after uni. I was a research scientist at the Royal Free, and uh, you know, I got um, the calling of policing there. Um, I thought I was going to be a research scientist for the next thirty years, and then all of a sudden, I was starting to meet up with police in our hospital um, leisure centre. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know, once they declared that there were cops. I thought I'd start to see the human side of them. And then it, it reminded me of when I was in Jamaica, uh, I went to school out there, um, even though I was born in London. And I remember um, seeing black cops and I thought, hold on here, despite what I feel about them in the 60s and 70s with the sus law and everything, I start to see that policing was a laudable profession. And, um, you know, I thought, well, you know, I've got to give it a shot um, because there's certain, certain, certain people are starting to say, well, listen, we need a more reflective police service. And they were doing a recruitment drive. And uh, I realized that, you know, you can only steer a ship from the shore. You've got to be on board in the captain's cabin to make changes. So the calling of policing was there. And um, I could have lost it because soon after applying, my dad got beaten up by cops. And, um, wow, wow. you know, he sued them uh, and, um, you know, for unlawful arrest and excessive force. But it didn't stop me from pushing with it, and um, the rest is history. I just wanted to did say, um, off, Leroy, did he cuss um, you off? Um, what, what, what did you once he had been assaulted? Say again, Slim. Sorry, uh, say was, again, your, Slim. was your dad upset with you for joining the force once he was assaulted by them? Well, he didn't like police in the first place. But <laughs> he, so he was, he, he was more than vexed. He was vexed. You know what I mean? He was not happy, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, and, and he, how he found out, because uh, they, they normally check your prem, uh, premises when you're um, going to join, make sure you're not living next to an armed blagger or someone like that, or you mm. could be at risk in some way. And um, mm. they, they went round to my parents' address, not to the address where I was living with my wife. And, you know, he called me up and said, why? I tell you, don't let police come to my yard. And I said, what, what's wrong, Dad? I said, he said, but they said, they want... You ain't joined the police, <laughs> you might. So. Yeah. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what's funny? I know we're all laughing about it, but don't you think how bad things have been for us, yeah? That the only two groups of people that are fearful of police are criminals and black people. Don't you think that's, that says yeah. a lot no, it's about not. our <laughs> relationship? Because brother, I, I think his dad might not have had any, any runnings with police before, but it's in him. That mm. police is against us. It's terrible. Yeah, I, terrible. I, I was the same. I, I was the same. Yeah, me but too. like everything, mm. I, I, I had to say, listen, I'm going to put certain things aside. Because uh, when you get a call in yeah. the police, you know, I was even questioning my sanity, thinking, what's this voice in my head about leaving science and becoming a cop? And, you know, I just couldn't get it out of my head. And I thought, listen, I'm going to give this a try. And even my boss said, listen, I'll keep your job open for six months. If you don't like it, to come back because Hendon back. Uh, um, yeah. is literally 10 minutes drive from uh, the Royal Free in Hampstead. So, you know, right. I thought, well, listen, let me try it for six months. And if I don't like it, you know, well, I didn't like it yeah. after six months, but I, I had an appetite 
to make even greater changes. And um, yeah, and so it went on and but in, set up the Black Police Association, etc. Yeah. So in 30 years, you must have seen a lot of changes in the police force. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, there was a lot of casual racism in those days, um, you know, not yeah. directly um, at me, because I, you know, I know I had to give them some lyrics and just cut that dead. But um, they would say it to other people. And, I, you know, that casual racism was very bad. I even had the N word written on my locker and all that sort of stuff, because, wow, uh, you know, wow. I, was like, I, I make it clear no, no, when I narcotics. joined the police. Say again. What was, that? what was that? Narcotics. Oh, you wish. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it 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 was really um, very bad. And, and but I already had said before I joined the police, I'm a black man who happens to be a cop, not a cop who happens to be black, because your mindsets be totally different. So you integrate and you don't assimilate, because that's what you find with a lot of even black officers. They want to assimilate and 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 that's do even. Right more things to conform to norms and values of the culture. Whereas I wanted to change the culture because I found it very hostile, it's very toxic. Um, but because I, I think I was fortunate that my first um, station was Islington where I grew up. So I knew all the run-ins, I knew all the people. I went to Hyde Grove School. In fact, sometimes I had to arrest a couple of my mates from school and which didn't go down very well, but I treat Pretty people with respect and dignity. I wasn't saying yeah. it's a them and us, it's a we. We have to keep our streets safe and secure. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, for me, it was a, it, it was an, an issue that I had to make it clearly where I stand. And if they didn't like it, well, that's their problem. But, you know, I, I made it clear I wasn't going to condone bad behavior, whether it's police or the public. And I wasn't into misplaced loyalties and any other sort of things that can stop me from carrying out my job. So I kept focus, kept on the tracks, you know, not to be derailed by personalities or prejudices and achieve my true potential. Fantastic. Okay. Well, look, you are a founding member of the National Black Police Association. Um, when did it start and why did you feel it necessary to have such an organisation? Well, I, it, I was a founding member of the London Black Police, uh, Black Police Association in the first instance. So how did that happen? Well, basically, that initiative about... The, you, you know, the number of officers that from black and minority groups who are leaving the organization, because you're four to five times more likely to leave the organization in the first couple of years. So that initiative called the Bristol Seminars, and he cart this off to Bristol um, Polytechnic as it was then, and put us in the syndicates and put us through the real mill saying, why were you leaving? What was the hostile environment about? How did it play itself out? And, um, in fact, I was one of the people um, that worked on the, the final report. And as usual, the report was shelved, you know, basically ended up in, in a lot of people's um, bins, really. And, but we came together because, you know, for the first time, we saw hundreds of other black officers across the Met. And we just kept um, having socials. And we used to have um, BPA dances. And that used to attract not only other police officers from all over London and across the country, but black firefighters, black lawyers, black comedians, all sorts of people in the, in the arts. Um, and, you know, we just thought, wow, you know, and it drew that sense of belonging and, and coll collaboration. And then, and we just said, well, listen, let's, let's formalize this. And so about four years later, um, having set up our constitution, we launched in September, 94 and, you know, we, we, our coming out party really was the Stephen Lawrence um, inquiry, you know, the McPherson report, where myself and two other officers said that the police service was institutionally racist, which you can imagine put us on the target of all sorts of things, you know. And shortly yeah, after yeah. that, I was the um, first chair of the National Black Police Association, which I helped found. And, you know, I was investigate myself and it was, it was really tough. But listen, guys. Yeah. You can you can buy the book and find out more about it. I want to I want to I want to I want to pick later on. I want to pick up on uh, what you just said, uh, Leeway. I want to pick up on the fact of when you uh, yourself organised the the Black Peace Association. How did you you think your white counterparts, fellow officers, reacted to you um, forming such a, a group? Well, you know they come up with the same old thing. Well, 
why don't we have a white association? Well, you have got white associations called a federation <laughs> because the federation <laughs> was pushing against yeah. us because even before we launched, they, they, you know, they're trying to say, oh, we, these officers, uh, they should be sacked or they should be reprimanded in some way. So, you know, they, because we were setting up because they have failed black officers and representing them because again, um, a uh, disproportionate number of officers were being investigated if you're black and you're white, you've got more chance of leaving. Um, you know, they weren't, you know, the, the, the snowy peak syndrome of the Met, you know, all the black officers are at the lower rungs and the white board and the higher senior officers um, uh, are sort of setting up the top, you know, like a glass of Guinness, you know what I mean? And I thought to myself, no, we, we've got to change the environment for our officers um, to assist in the recruitment, retention and progression and at the same time, build bridges with the black community, speak on their behalf, let them know we are black people, part of the community who happen to be police officers. And, you know, it, it, it made it clear to them. And I suppose after McPherson, they actually feared us. They actually feared us. It was amazing it was how the, the dynamics yeah, changed. The power. Yeah, the yeah, power yeah. dynamics was, you know, well, yeah. don't upset them. You know, uh, there was a bit of pushback because, mm. you know, they tried to investigate us, but we just pushed it back on them. And, um, you know, it, it made us really, um, you know, respected, maybe grudgingly, but they had to respect us because we weren't yeah. rampant. Good, good, man. Are you uh, still listen. active? Are you still active with the, the association or have you... Yeah, I'm still, in, st time? still a fully paid up member. Um, you know, I liaise with the chair, um, the current chair, Janet Hills, uh, the first um, female chair, and she's brilliant, you know. And uh, she's doing a, a lot of great work. Um, uh, we uh, we set up a charity called Voyage Youth, um, a leadership program for our young people um, at year nine, and they can get a BTEC level two for doing a hundred hour modular course. And I seen before they start the GCSEs in year ten. So Voyage Youth's been running for almost twenty years, and I'm I'm still the chair, and you know, so I'm still active, you know, because. I could be chilling on a beach somewhere in, in Jamaica or Africa, in Ghana, you know, just I do, relaxing. I do your thing. I the struggle, your the team. struggle is still there. And I don't want my grandchildren to go through the same sort of rubbish that my children have gone through or I, I even gone through. So, you know, this, the struggle continues, you know? No, fantastic, man. Look, even that the Voyage program, I've, I've done some facilitation in the London Borough of Brent with the Voyage pr program. It's absolutely amazing, and it, it really does make a difference to young people. Uh, but listen, Leroy, we couldn't have you on here and not talk about stop and search. You know, it's it's a big uh, talking uh, <clears throat> point at the moment. It's a controversial tactic. I want to ask you, does it work? If it's used properly. It, it is a tool, a blunt tool. But it's sharpened up with community information and intelligence. So what is commensurate with that amount of information and intelligence is trust and confidence. The more the community trust and have confidence in you, they will tell you what's going on. I mean, when mm. I was superintendent of Hackney, I didn't have to be stopping everyone. I knew exactly who to stop and where they're going to be because I had a proactive stance. I was able to say, well, listen, I know what the next few is going to be. I know how certain people are going to respond to that because I have that shared and common experience. So I put myself in their position to say, listen, if man's going to do that to me, how am I going to respond? I'm not doing a, a random, you know, scattergun approach, you know, that's not based on intelligence. So that's the problem. Um, until such time they really use an intelligence um, approach, you're going to get you know, that, that sort of randomness. And, and that's the pro problem with me. And if they don't get that intelligence increase, they'll always be upsetting people. And, you know, you're, it's only one out of 10 people who are stopped who actually, actually have something, maybe some drugs, it's mainly drugs, maybe some mm -hmm. weapons. They, they don't actually are stopped for any reason. So that's nine, to, nine people out of 10 are upset. And especially if you've been stopped several times that month or even that year, you think to yourself, hold on, well, no. you are good... disrespecting me. And I think with this George Floyd thing and the Black Lives Matter, people have said enough is enough. You know, well, social listen, media and right. just, videos. Well, 
Go on. I just want to jump in there because uh, I want you to have a look at this incident as we're talking about intelligence. Uh, this was the incident that led to the stop and search team, uh, stop and search of team GB athlete uh, Bianca Williams and her boyfriend Ricardo DeSantis. Let's have a look at this. You're right. Cool. Cool. <laughs> Wow. So, because my, my take on it, when I watched it, it just, it definitely didn't look right. And um, apparently they've been stopped 15 times in the last few weeks since they bought the Mercedes. Now, in your opinion, from what we saw, do you feel like that was intelligence led or was it racial profiling? Absolutely racial profiling. Because the way in which they said they were smelling weed and, you know, okay. the way in which, all right, they may have been fed up and they thought, listen, we're not going to stop. Um, they might have been driving carelessly or whatever it may be. But, you, you know, I know how those officers react because I think there was a couple of things there. I, I, I believe that somehow there's a mark on that vehicle, you know, whether it's a uh, deeper dealt of drugs or W whiskey for weapons. There's something when, they, you know, you do that check on that vehicle, the officers get the marker and they think, ah, oh, they must be up to something. So that's why it, that might... It, 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 um, create that frequency of stops. The second thing is, I got a real concern when the default situation is to drag people out, handcuff them and rough them up. You know, you, you should be able to stop an account. So you say, right, you stop them. Why are you driving like that? What are you, um, what, what's the reason for your behavior, whatever. So there's a stop an account before you're going to stop and search and hands on. Now I've got to think, yeah. If that was a white couple with a baby in the back, would they stop? Especially the female officers going in the back and still dragging out with a baby in their arms, which is madness. And I, and I you know, I hear so many cases where I see, you know, black people roughed up in a way that I don't see white people roughing up. I don't see people rolling on the ground and pinning them down and in a in an unprofessional and unjustified and unnecessary way. So for me, you know, it's racial profiling, even if it's the, the way in which they conduct in the search, you know, even if they had the legitimate intelligence, you don't treat people in that undignified and disrespectful way. And we're just seeing that conduct is commensurate with the, the ethnicity of that person. And I think it's because they fear black people in a lot of ways, because I hear how they talk. I ain't gonna take in that nonsense. Or, you know, even before they go into a certain borough, I used to hear them, well, I'm, you're going to hack me. Oh, you've got to be careful, mate. Oh, it's hard work out there. But if they're going to Hampstead, oh, you're, you're all right, mate, you know. And, and, the, and, and that impacts on the type of policing. You know, if you're here, you're going to Brixton. Yeah. Whoa, keep it cool, man. Relax. Don't take any nonsense from them. But if you're going to Belgravia, oh, you're sorted. And even before they put a foot on the ground, they're already in that mindset, that adversarial yeah aggressive mindset. Mm -hmm. so, so do you think then, because to me that sounds even more insidious then, because that sounds more than unconscious bias. That sounds like it's, it's premeditated bias um, because they're getting themselves in the mind frame where they're going into it at maybe 70%, where they should be starting off at 10, 20% and doing an investigation. Everybody understands tone and there's nothing worse than when you feel as if You've been accused of something that you're not done. And the way how they're acting with you physically and speaking to you is in such a disrespectful way that you start pushing back. Remember, an innocent person will always fight back anyway. That's not an admission of guilt. And they're responding, saying, oh, calm down. Why are you so aggressive? Why are you shouting? But if uh, somebody else, anybody, a human being, if you approach someone 15 times in three weeks, of course I'm going to be annoyed. Of course. And that really upset me. No, absolutely. And, and, and until they understand that, you know, I, I think especially if a young person is getting stopped regularly, it causes trauma, you know, and that toxic yeah, stress yeah. is there all the time because, I mean, 
you're, you remember when you're a youngster, you have to be thinking about, boy, am I going to get stopped for this, that, and the other? Uh, you know, you might still be going through that. Am I going to stop my car and whatever? And that builds up. And I think there's a definitely adverse child experiences that needs to be assessed fully. And, you know, I've been doing work on the Youth Violence Commission and we're really looking at how that stress and trauma builds up on a day-to-day, year-to-year basis. And we've got to, you know, really address this issue because, you know, you cannot use a, a power and seem to be an occupying force instead of a police service. And that's what's happened. And, you know, I've actually said that the look and feel of policing is like a pre McPherson era. We've gone back 20 years, you know, and certain officers feel emboldened, they're untouchable, they're, you know, they're, they're unaccountable and they think that you just can do these things. And I think it's because it's coming from the top. You know, Cressetta Dick yeah. really needs to look at her position because she has not done anything to reduce this um, hands-on aggressive, you know, public uh, punitive enforcement tactics that uh, addresses certain right wing certain mindsets. And, you know, it goes right across and certain officers are thinking, especially after Brexit where hate crime went up through the roof, they think, why, you know, I can do what I want. And it's been, it's showing on the streets, yeah, yeah. but someone has to pull back. And it, it's cause the black lives matter issue really start to think, hold on here, you guys are getting out of order. But remember all of the riots that have occurred over the years is when they have Tory governments, because they're big on this whole enforcement piece. And the Met in particular has been even more um, draconian, because even though it's only one of 43 force areas across the country, it accounts for a third of all stop and searches across the country. Right. So, you know, they, they, they've had a historical way of dealing with people that, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't happen in Manchester, Liverpool, Nottingham, but the way the Met has approached this over the decades, especially since black people settled here with the Windrush generation, et cetera, they have taken this thing to another level. So we need to bring it back from the pre-McPherson era into 21st century and hold people to account. And I just hope the mayor and, well, I'm not even thinking about the Home Secretary because she's on a different tip, but I'm hoping that the mayor of London and various other mayors will hold their police, um, you know, um, police to account you know, their, um, their police crime com um, commissioners, hold them to account, you know, and don't allow all this nonsense to continue. Well, uh, thank you very much, Leroy, for that. Um, now, look, it, it did uh, uh, prompt uh, Dam Cressida, sorry, Dame Cressida Dick to apologise. Have a look at this. Every time we see a video that is of concern to members of the public, we review them, we see if there are any lessons learned, uh, and I don't rule out in this case, and as I said, I, you know, my senior officer has said, has, I didn't say this, but she said, I'm sorry to, to, to Ms Williams for the distress it has clearly caused her, and I say that too. So if there are lessons uh, to be learned from it, we will learn them, and I am looking at handcuffing as a specific issue. There's a couple of questions, right? Anyway, the first question, when police say lessons learned, what does she actually mean by lessons learned? Because we hear that all the time when they mess up. So what, what is that exactly that, that, that's a stop, learned? That's, stop, that's a stop line to say, well, actually, we're not going to do much. You yeah. know, that's the stop line that has to be, well, you know, it just fends it off, kicks it into the long grass, lessons learned. You hear about that, all sorts of reviews, you know, and not just to deal with black people, but all sorts of social care issues. Lessons learned, lessons learned. Yeah. Unless you have a, a statement of intent, you are actually going to do something and how you're going to do it and make it specific time based and how you're going to make sure they got independent oversight. Because, you know, when the McPherson recommendations were brought in in 1999, for the first 10 years, you had the Stephen Lawrence Steering Group holding chief constables to account. They actually made sure that they weren't allowed to mark their own homework. And then when the steering group was dissolved, they, they then passed on the, the oversight to the chief counsel, you know, the National Police Chief Council, or ACPO as it used to be. And then they start to mark their own homework. So obviously they're gonna be great. And then, then they start pushing back saying, institutional racism doesn't exist. It's not for them to say. So I'm hoping the Home Affairs Select Committee that's um, kicked in late last year, it was stalled by the, um, the election and obviously COVID stalled it. I hope they start to do that real in-depth analysis of how they've even dealt with the, 
the McPherson recommendations and the whole issue around institutional racism. But for personally, the Met is still institutionally racist and it's got even worse with Cressida Dick. Can, can I just say, uh, what, last question, um, IPCC, so when there's a situation like this, they investigate, so is the police investigating the police. If we had a situation <laughs> where members of the public or a board or a council holding the police uh, accounts, do you think that we will have different results? Well, just to, just to clarify, the, the IPCC, Independent, Independent Police Complaints Commission, is now called the Independent Office for Police Conduct. Now, I know it's like a rebrand that they went through, especially after Doug, yeah. after they messed up with that. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there was no critical distance between them and the, and the police, in particular the Met. So they have gone through a change, a, a, you know, a root and branch change. And I'm not saying that, that they're um, perfect, but they're in a better position than they have been. So I think the IOPC can actually do, a, they actually said they're going to do a review, not only around stop and search, but the impact of it, etc. Now, I would like to think that they, this is a chance for them to put a line in the sand and say, listen, we are standing up for holding the, the police service to account. But besides that, I think they have to bring in independent oversight, expert people who are not going to look at all the gloss, because I know the Met's brilliant, giving you a nice glossy document, showing you officers kicking in doors and all, you know, the blue lights and the sirens, which a lot of people get sucked into and think, oh, they're so amazing. But they're not amazing if you are on the receiving end of that in an unlawful way. So you've got to have, you know, I would think um, real investigative lawyers, um, even people like myself to say, listen, I know exactly how the strokes are. I know how certain things are done to make it look glossy. You need to have independent oversight because as I said, if they're marking their own homework, that it's never gonna be at the benefit of the community, especially the black community. Okay. Now, stop and search itself is an important tactic in the fight against knife crime, but why can't the police seem to be able to implement it the right way? Well, you see, that's another fallacy. There is no correlation between stop and search and knife crime. Never has been, and I doubt if it ever will be. Less than 5%. 5%, so five out of 100 stops leads to some sort of knife-related incident. So that's 95% of people stop. Nothing to do with knives, right? So, but what is, as I said, the, the essential matter here is where are you going to get the information from? So you've got to build bridges with a target group of young people who might be into that, you know, especially the ones on the margins. You need those early intervention and prevention programs to assist them not to get into that. And, you know, bring back, you know, it's not just police, it should be all sorts of, um, you know, um, building out grassroots organizations. It has to be youth workers. You know, youth workers, um, again, when I was in Hackney, they were worth their weight in gold in terms of information because they would nip things in the bud and they were problem solvers. So, you know, I, I would get information that, knife crime can be dealt with without stop and search bringing in officers so that's where they've gone the full swing of the pendulum on the other way to think there is this correlation and you know you know when you're really getting to a police officer well in my experience as a police officer i know stop and search works well that doesn't mean anything because the analysis even the home office analysis go on their website you will see stop and search has no correlation with knife crime. And it's an absolute fallacy and fabrication when officers say, when you reduce stop and search, knife crime goes up. Not Nagosa. Oh, whoa. I think they need to bring back the, the, they need to bring back the beat, Bobby. The guy, like what, when you start the cops. local Bobby Absolutely. that everybody knew, they knew the community, they knew the bad guys was, they knew. At, Right now, you're getting independent police or police that don't know the community that are, the are area. actually, yeah, do you understand? Yeah. So everybody's yeah, yeah, a stranger to them. They're a stranger to everybody. You, you've hit the nail on the head. When I 
out in Hackney, we were this, one of the first um, boroughs to bring in safe and able teams, which was one sergeant, two constables, and three police community officers. And those officers, six, so six officers ring fence to that ward. They would build bridges with all of the community, in particular targeting youngsters who are at risk of being involved in some, certain types of crime and violence. And as a result of that, we got a, so much information. As I said, it gave us a proactive stance. We even had safer schools officers working with the youngsters. So you, you, weren't, you weren't into this w walking into certain things blind. And mm -hmm. the other thing was, which again didn't make me Mr. Popular, when the guys in the van, guys and girls in the van, the territorial support group, um, or the TSG, or in some people, the T's and Stacks group, because they love them TNN and Stacks, they would come onto the borough and start, um, you know, roughing up people. So I used to brief them personally. I said, listen, you don't going to be patrolling in your van and just come out in numbers. If you do need to come out and you have to be um, in the van, no more than two. And then if you need to build up because the risk increases, add another two. The rest of you are walking. LEG2, you are walk. And if you don't like it, that's down to you. But I'm, you're my asset. I've called you in from central London. You will do what you are told. Now, they don't like it. And, you know, other chief inspectors and superintendents come up to me. Oh, you know, you, you, you're, you're a bit um, prescriptive. You're damn right I am. Because I don't want you to create merry hem in my, my borough and you then disappear and I've got to deal with the fallout. The other mm. thing is, which is, a, again, racial problem, profiling to the extreme, is these things called Section 60 um, roadblocks. I don't know if you have heard of them. So if there's fear of violence have occurred and fear of it happening again, mm -hmm. you, um, a superintendent in my day, would authorize a demarcated area within that borough to stop certain people. Now, the officer, because I'm doing the authority, the officers don't have to show reasonable grounds where they stop people, right? Now, that's how it should be. The only time I was bottom of the class in the Met was Section 60s, because officers will come to me with a lack of intelligence on the information. And I said, that's not good enough. Come back to me when you have enough information that I feel that I can authorize those Section 60s. Right. And they again, Mr. Unpopular, but I have to make sure I'm holding those officers to account. Proper supervision and leadership, which is lacking right now. You know what they've done now? Section 60s now can be authorized by an inspector, which is two ranks down. Now, I know how tough it was to stand up to those officers because I said, God, you know, there's going to be a lot of violence. Yeah. This is the area I'm dis designating. If you don't like it, no. And come back to me with the proper information as well. Mm. Inspectors, because they're very close to the constables and sergeants, they find it really difficult to, to say no. Say no. So, yeah. And not only that, no. they make it a borough wide section 60. So you, you can be in play anywhere on that borough, which is nonsense well, because mm. if you've got a bit of trouble in Tottenham, why are you stopping black people in High, Highgate? They've got yeah, nothing to do right. with knife crime yeah. up there. Yeah. Madness. Well, listen, uh, Leroy, I wonder if you could have a look at this. Uh, for anyone else, uh, we have to issue a warning that you may find this footage very, very, very distressing. Get off me! Get off my neck! Get off my neck! I ain't done anything wrong! Get off my neck! Stay down, stay calm! Stay calm, stay calm. Okay, have you done anything? Thank you very much. Get off my neck! Stay calm, stay calm! Stay calm, stay calm! Stay calm! Have you done anything? Stay down. Get your hand off your head. Back up. Stay down. Move back over. Stay down. As two arresting officers, you're fucked. Shut it. Have your pinky in your ear, bro. Shut it. What do you mean, shut it, bro? Are you alright, bro? Fuck off. I'm recording this. Hey, Rob. Hey, Rob. It's cool. Hey, Rob. It's cool. Relax. Relax. Rob, relax. 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 Move back. I know it's only a short clip of what went on, but can we get your view on the officer's conduct, please? 
Well, in this day and age, after George Floyd, for an officer to even think about putting his knee on the neck of someone, beggar's belief. I mean, it's totally unprofessional, totally unnecessary, and totally disproportionate. Because I know if someone's struggling, you may have to hold their neck to prevent them from hurting themselves. It's not there to get compliance, it's to prevent them from hurting themselves. And you may need other officers to hold the limbs, again, to stop them from hurting themselves. It's not to hurt the officers, it's to prevent them hurting themselves. But my thing is, the man's handcuffed. He is handcuffed. So he's not posing a risk. And I would even think it's easier to control someone, not just when they're laying down, because they've got more leverage, sit them up, sit them up. Because that's, that's, that's what diffuses a lot of things. Because when you bring someone in a sitting position, you can hold their shoulders back and the handcuffs, right? So it, it looks a lot less. So for, for me, that, that is a totally draconian act. That officer should be sacked. I, I, you know, I'm glad they suspended him. I, I, I've, always, I've, I've even tweeted on this, that this person has no disregard. And you know the thing is, I think the, they've never been trained on that sort of um, maneuver. They picked it up right, through okay. whether they see in the States. It, it's never been trained even, you know, and we've had um, similar sort of um, George Floyd incidents with the Rashan Charles thing, where you may have seen the boy rushed into the shop and the officer yeah, put yeah. a lock and bar around his neck, the arm mm -hmm. moved, and saying he's trying to get drugs out the young man's mouth. Not trained to do that. Since when are you a doctor to try and get drugs out of someone's mouth? It's nonsense. And as a result of that, it contributed to that boy's death. It was an unavoidable act. And, you know, yeah. that for me shows that the, the whole culture has been hijacked by this really punitive, hard hitting type of police and that, that look that, that they now look like an occupying force. And, you know, it, it's unrecognizable to me. And I've only been retired seven years, but you know, we need to address this issue because it's quite clear if we don't get, you know, if you don't get officers sacked, right? Or even gripping the rail in court, this will continue. And it needs, mm. as I said, leadership from the top to make sure officers are held to account and, and, and make, examples of him or her that you cannot do that because it's only up to, to black people i don't see any white people with an officer with the, the the knee on the neck or or, Kalina, or the, never, the, the, never. The, the, the neck hold we Lewis, were can I just say on our previous um episode about actually an idea about actually suing the actual individual policeman if the or police officer in that way, financially, there's a threat to them. Do you understand? As well as charges. If the police officer knows, you could actually be sued for um, a wrongful act, arrest, or anything like that. I can actually see you, as well as the organisation. Do you think that would make a difference in uh, individual listen, policemen's actions? Listen, there's two things that are going to control behaviour. You hit their pocket, or you, mm -hmm. they hit the prison cell. Two things, those are main things, right? Because I, even, as I said to you, my dad was assaulted 30 odd years ago and he sued them. He got a financial reward, but he didn't hit the officer's pocket. He still That's carried right. on with his, um, with yeah. his career, right? You've got to make them liable. So I, I truly believe, let them be personally liable so yeah. that they, they cannot think, well, I can do that act, but the, the job's gonna pick up the bill. Yeah, you know, mm, and yeah. I really think those, those specific, and also if they have got back track record, they can't go for specialism, you know, go on to specialist units, they can't go for promotion, all of these things, or they, you know, because on the appraisals, it doesn't say how many complaints you've had, how many violent arrests you've had, how many people have um, complained about you. And yeah, I always say uh, to people, please complain, go on the IOPC website, it takes 20 minutes put it on there because it goes on the commissioner's desk so she can't play with it and then and there's an audit trail right and they have to um investigate it properly and that goes on the officer's um, um file so at least you know and they can show it in court because i would be surprised that officer with his his knee on the person's neck 
if he goes to trial, that, that he's done it before. Look, look at the showman guy with George Floyd. The guy yeah. was a murderer yeah. in, the, in the making, and he's a yeah. murderer now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Can yeah. I just say, Leroy, yeah. um, that that particular officer has been suspended. Do you think that he got suspended because of uh, um, reaction because of the George Floyd, or he got suspended because of the lack of training? Um, he probably didn't receive. No, no, it's, it's, the, it's the George Floyd Black Lives Matter. I'm telling you, there is a sea change. There's, there's a movement that people are not going to put up with this. And it's quite clear that the, the Met and the government and the mayor are starting to think, this is not going away. This is not going away. People are starting to move in a way that it's, it's a, it's a bottom-up approach. It's the masses coming to say, enough's enough. And, and, you know, that sleeping giant of black people who said, boy, well, what can you do? You can. You've got to organise, you've got to mobilise and start to really working strategically to hold everyone to account because, you know, it's costing lives and we can't have any more lives. Because as I said, I don't want my grandchildren to be a potential victim of that because they're just going about the law for business and you've got an overzealous couple. So I'd like to think it's a, here is a crossroad of change for the Met. You know, shape up, and, and then those officers who won't shape up, ship out. Wonderful, yeah, man. Yeah, Listen, I, Leroy, I, man, I, we I, we I, could. Talk when you to look you. at when you look at how they when. Sorry, go on, see, go on, when, when you look at how, when when you look at how they um, implement um, trying to um, subdue somebody, you can see that they don't understand about human behavior because if someone has got me handcuffed, anybody, you got someone handcuffed on the floor. And then you're trying to hold his head down with force for no reason. You're going to get a backlash. You're going to get the person fighting back. It's like they just want to submit you. Like, you're, like they're supposed to have this power over you. That anything they do is okay because they've got a uniform on. And that don't feel right. And it's been going on for so long. I've been stopped before. I've had a gun held to me from a police officer. I've, had, I've been punched in my face by a police officer. And I should have taken them to court. And I didn't because I didn't think anything was going to happen. A so we've got to change. Yeah, but we've got to try and change how we think about it and what we can do about it. Because I swear to you, I thought to myself, nothing's going to happen, so there's no point. The guy punched me in my face. I went to the police station. They took pictures of my face. Um, but what it was, I was being racially abused by some other guy. We ended up in a fight. Police came. Thought I was the instigator. Punched me in my face. Anyway, took pictures of my mouth, whatever. When I went to court, the police officer lied and said he didn't hit me. He lied, first of all. And then when I tried to get the image from the picture of, like, on my mouth, like, it disappeared. The footage in this police station, in Charing Cross Police Station, um, disappeared. They said they, could, they no longer have it. They can't find it. So it's, it's the whole system. The whole system is just rigged against you. It's just rigged. And I'm, so, I'm totally glad agree. that somebody like you has gone in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the thing no. is that... The, the, all I would say is, right, please complain. I mean, with our Voids program, we, we instruct the young people on how to complain, how to make observations. Because when, when you get, have a stop and search, the, the officers have a mnemonic called Go Wise. So I hope your viewers yeah. will check this out. G mm -hmm. for Go is the grounds why the officer should be stopping you. O is the ob object, what they're looking for, whether it's a knife, drugs, whatever it may be. W of wise is the warrant card. Whether the officer's in uniform or not, they should have a warrant card, especially if they're in plain clothes. You need to know someone's, having, you know, have you over? Show me your warrant card. Um, and then I is the identity. I'm Superintendent Logan of, and then S is the station attached or the unit attached. And E is the entitlement to the stop slip. So that goal wise is something we, treat, we teach our youngsters since 2001 so that they know their rights and responsibilities. So they observe the officer's numbers or the, the, the insignia, whatever it may be. Because if it's an inspector on above, they only have insignia, they don't have numbers. Yeah. So check the person's yeah. name out. All of these things. And we say Great complain. Because as I said, it builds a picture of a rogue cop. If that officer is into roughing up people and he's got a high complaint level or whatever that is, the officer can be reprimanded. I used to oh, hold exactly. officers to account when I knew that they're up to no good. So, you know, I would suggest the IOPC is online, 20 minutes tops. I've done it several times for people. 
especially our young people on voyage, to say, listen, complain. It gives us that picture of that road cop. Fantastic advice. Listen, light, see, light man, we could talk to you all day, man. We could talk yeah, to you all day. Yeah. Listen, man, serious. Um, yeah, but anyway, before we go, uh, tell us about your new book, Closing Ranks. Well, I think the name tells us what it is, because what, one of the things that I, I've always found, um, even before I joined the police, you know, um, how, when, you know, with the SUS law, they would bring in a certain type of, you know, mindset. Oh, my officers, let me refresh my notes. Oh, yeah, my officers. And their notes were collaborated. So they closed ranks around someone to, to stitch them up or, you know, not yeah. to give them the proper evidence. And I saw that so many times. Even my cousin had to head back to Jamaica before he got a custodial sentence because a sus law, he got arrested three times. And the magistrate said, you will go into prison next time you come in front of me. So I know what it's like, even before I joined the police. And then, you know, I used to say to people, don't even try have those sort of conversations or collaborations, stitching people up or anything like that, because I will. Even when I was, before I was a supervisor. I'm gonna cuss you, you know. Yeah, it's true. I saw it, man. You see, I was, like, gonna was about to come out, you know. I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw it. it. <laughs> and then he remembered how much he was getting with his pension. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I, I, know you, I know you can edit it out, but I'm not trusting it. Just in my no, this is okay. live, bro. We don't edit out nothing. We don't edit out nothing <laughs> at all. Leroy, before we get your honestly. pension reinvolved, we we got to say thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, no, but, yeah, my, <laughs> we'll so look my, out my, for your book is. and everything. I know, I know our producers got our producers got uh, a copy of your book. Uh, final thoughts, please, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen. I, I, the, the book is there to show not only why police do certain things and how they do things, but also to equip the community to say, listen, you know your rights. Please stand up for yourselves and others, you know, and don't buy into this thing about I'm not a racist. Well, if you're not a racist, prove it. It's just like mm. the police. If you're not institutional racist, prove it, you know, and if the same things are happening as it was, say, 20, 40 years ago, you are still in the same woods you're not out of the woods so the, the book is there to hopefully have a conversation and you know let people know i might have been in the police for 30 years but i'm not i'm not i'm no sellout i'm still a black man and i'm still in the struggle and it will continue until my dying day thank you so much man and look we wish you all the best with the book um, it's been thank a pleasure you having you on the show. Appreciate it. Appreciate uh, it. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for for this week. Um, just before we go, on, let's have a quick round up with the gents to find out what's happening. Slim, what are you doing this week, sir? As I said, meetings and hopefully, you know, signatures will be on certain contracts. And yeah, I'll have good news for you lot. Next Wonderful, week. man. I'm looking forward to it, man. Looking forward to it. Kane, I know, so you've got the big dating dilemmas going in. What's happening on the ground with your yes, dating show? I, I'm waiting for my bringing from Slim when he gets his contract signed. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> Come on, no. Yeah, let's go for him, man. See? <laughs> yes, man. Come on, What's now. happening with your radio show, bro? Uh, uh, we, uh, I've got a few guests on this week, but judging by our last guest, I'm going to... Um, I've got some contracts to sign, but if it doesn't go my way, I'm going to have to buy his book. So I end up in that police cell. Wonderful, wonderful. So look, it just leads me to say goodbye. And I want to say a big thank you to everybody for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment and share. But remember, uh, we're nothing without your support. See you next week, same time, same place. Hashtag comedy TV. You can tell me who invented the light bulb, right? Thomas Edison, right? Everybody knows Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Thomas Edison invented a light bulb with a paper filament. It burnt out in no time at all. Can you tell me who invented the filament that makes these lights shine throughout? Nobody knows, because it's a black man. I was not taught in schools. Lewis Howard Latimer invented the carbon filament to allow lights to continuously shine. Who knows that? Everything should be, teach, should be taught. When you go back through the, the schooling as a young man, I remember my school days. I was never taught anything good about black people. And you cannot have a society that is brought up like that, both white and black, that only teach what's convenient to the teacher. History is written by the conqueror, not by those that are conquered. History is written 
by the people who do the harm, not by the people who get harmed. And we need to go back and teach both sides of history. And until we do that and educate the entire human race, this thing will not stop. They keep, they keep on telling me there is nothing called white privilege. Give me a break. I don't see any white people going into a store on Oxford Street and being followed. A black man walks in, somebody is following him everywhere he goes. That is basic white privilege. Whether that white person went in to rob the place or not, is not going to be thought of that way. And things like that have to change. Until the philosophy which hold one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned everywhere is war it's a war that until they're no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes miss a war that until the basic human rights or he guarantee to all without regard to race and this a war that until that day the dream of lasting peace world citizenship rule of international morality will remain in but a fleeting illusion to be pursued but never attain Now everywhere is war War And until the ignoble and unhappy regime That hold our brothers in Angola In Mozambique South Africa Sub a human bondage been toppled, totally destroyed.